Welcome to Football Never Sleeps. I'm Wally Pip. He's Tyler James. Actually, I'm Eric Hansen. As the label says, I'm I'm back from vacation. Football does take a vacation. It just never sleeps. Um, <laughs> and I'm sitting in for Charleston Bowles, who I think probably blew you guys away while I was on vacation, but he did a great job. We're here to talk Notre Dame football like we usually do. We're going to talk some of my one-on-one -on -one with Marcus Freeman last week, get into some of the issues that are affecting Notre Dame football. We've got lots of recruiting talk, which Tyler has been really digging into and Charleston is probably working on as we speak. What we need from you is to send us some questions and we'll work them in during our conversation. We also need you to hit the subscribe button if you haven't already. Hit the like button, anticipating that you will like this and uh, hit the notification bell so you always know when we have new content. It's not just this show. We'll have all kinds of video from camps and recruiting visits and all kinds of stuff. People walking on the bus. It's a compelling video. <laughs> if I forgot anything, Tyler James is here to pick up the pieces, so we'll send it over to Tyler. Yeah, uh, hopefully everyone – well, first of all, Eric, welcome back. Um, Thanks. Uh, you're almost you're you're not as sunburned as I am from all the camps that I'm outside covering, but um, uh, I, I'm glad to have you back. I'm glad you enjoyed your time away. Um, and yeah, there's been plenty of Notre Dame football stuff to discuss, um, and I think Charleston did a great job as well. Um, if you are new to the program and process, uh, make sure you know how to submit questions, and you need to do it through YouTube. Um, so if you're on a desktop, the, the chat box should be to the right hand side of the are talking heads. Um, and if you're on a mobile device or a, an app of some sort, um, the chat box should be below us. So um, you should see some other questions coming in. If you are um, just stopping by and don't necessarily have questions, but want to say hello, we appreciate that as well. Um, and thank you to, for all of you who are joining us live and remaining loyal to us throughout the, the summer, which just getting started, but uh, we'll be over in terms of Notre Dame football uh, before we know it. So let's, let's hit, some of your conversation, Eric, with Marcus Freeman that you had last week. Um, I know there were lots of different takeaways, um, but I, I think he, your big story um, was sort of Marcus Freeman and his question everything mantra and how what he's doing is impacting the program, how he views things, how he's transitioning Notre Dame's program from the Brian Kelly area. Um, what was your... I guess what were the issues that you saw um, and addressed with, with Marcus Freeman as things move forward for Notre Dame? Right. So, well, I had 30 minutes. I tried to hit on some um, things about the team, what was going on with the team currently caught up on some of that. And we'll talk about some of those things later, but the real three issues I tried to hit were the three that I think most Notre Dame fans are the most concerned about in terms of, guiding the big picture with Notre Dame, you know, whether they can ascend from this point with Marcus Freeman in the second year or whether there's some forces that are really pushing back and making things difficult. So for me, those three issues were the facilities upgrades, uh, Notre Dame's transfer policy, and then how NIL, both in its intended and corrupted forms, fits in with the Notre Dame recruiting approach. So what what I was really, um, I don't want to say surprised, but what I was impressed with from Marcus Freeman's standpoint, a lot of times when we'll ask him this in a press conference about those kinds of things, he'll say, you know, well, it's above my pay grade. And the reason he does that is he doesn't want to, He's he's very careful because he doesn't want to, send the message that a lack in any of those areas is the reason they were nine and four last year instead of national champions or playing in the playoff. And so he is way more involved than uh, he lets on. And it's really kind of behind the scenes. And we got into some of how deep his involvement is. And we talked about all three of those issues. So I guess we can start with the transfer policy um, why don't Tyler, you explain what the current transfer policy is, and then I can get into a little bit about the direction they're trying to push things. Yeah. And the transfer policy, which we've gone over plenty of times is 
it's easy easier or easiest for grad transfers to come in when they have a graduate degree um, from Notre Dame. That's the easiest way to get into a, a, to Notre Dame as a football player, um, as a graduate it would be as a graduate transfer. Um, the second level of that is a freshman who doesn't have a lengthy uh, academic career um, at, at a different college and the, the, the trouble of transferring those credits to, to equate to what uh, a freshman at Notre Dame has taken. Um, and then sort of as it increases throughout your career as a college student, um, it gets more difficult as a sophomore. You have some chance as a junior, it's, it's virtually impossible. Um, and those are, and that, that is based on the academic schools at Notre Dame and their admissions policies and being able to bring in kids and wanting to get those kids to, to graduate with a Notre Dame degree and, and meeting certain requirements to, to get a Notre Dame degree from those schools. So that's where, where Notre Dame sits. What do you think, uh, what, I don't know. Marcus Freeman didn't necessarily provide a lot of specifics to you in terms of what it will look like, but what, how close do you think that is? And what do you have any sort of sense of what that may look like? Right. Well, what Marcus felt was that there has been progress. I mean, they're talking a lot, you know, Marcus cited an example where he was on a team plane with the um, faculty rep for athletics, uh, Trisha Bellia, um, I hope I didn't butcher her name. Uh, Jack Swarbrick, the outgoing athletic director, and Father John Jenkins, the university president. And they had this was just an example of the talks they've had about okay, now how can we make this work? There are people on the academic side that are concerned about two things transfer credits and that somebody could get a Notre Dame degree with having more credit somewhere else, which is really what they're trying to stay away from. Now, again, they could earn a second Notre Dame degree. Graduates, uh, graduate transfers have the choice of trying to get a master's, working towards a master's, or taking a non-degree seeking schedule. And that's something like Sam Hartman's going to do. His, He's already uh, has advanced degrees he's looking to get ready for the nfl and there are notre dame players that have been at notre dame the whole time looking for that and this is really where the push and pull is is how can they get the deans comfortable with someone that's shown to be a very good student in another school and that may have even qualified for notre dame coming out of high school but is further along it's been done before i know um Micah Shrewsbury just recruited a sophomore, uh, someone that just finished their sophomore year, and he's got some transfers that have finished just their freshman year. But he has been able to sneak a sophomore through. I think um, when people look at Neil Ivey and women's basketball, so they have the same issues, and they're all, all um, fighting the same fight, for lack of a better term. You know, there were a lot of hard no's for them when they were looking for a center. They ended up with Becky Obinma, who is a grad transfer. But but there were some pretty attractive uh, players that were options that would have been undergraduate transfers that didn't work. So Marcus's assessment is, you know, he said he feels like there's progress now. To what end? You know, we'll see in the next cycle. They have this whole summer and fall to kind of work on that before we get into the next uh, recruiting cycle. But it turns out with Notre Dame that all 10 transfers, including the three recruited walk-on transfers, are all grad transfers. Now, again, you're talking a lot higher volume than Notre Dame has ever done. 10 transfers in one cycle, they went eight years without even taking one grad transfer after the rule was passed. And then it was a trickle like Cody Riggs and then, you know, another handful over several years before they even took multiple transfers in one, one try. And, and when we look at undergraduate transfers, I mean, really in the modern era, there's been four. And, and so the, the last one was Brandon Joseph, who was close to getting his degree from Northwestern. But again, in talking to him, he had a lot of hoops to jump through. And, and he does 
when he goes back to try to get his degree, it's easier for him to go back to Northwestern and get that degree than to finish right. up at mm -hmm. Notre Dame. So I think this is critical in terms of Notre Dame when you think about the roster churn that's happening all over. I mean, they're never going to be a team that builds through the portal, but they do need to plug holes through the portal. And if they don't, their competition will. You know, USC, Lincoln Riley, under the old rules, would have had a tough rebuild at mm -hmm. USC. But he was at least able to plug a lot of offensive holes and, and really get a dynamic team right out of the gate. I, I think you'll still find teams like Georgia and teams like Michigan, Ohio State, they're mostly going to build through high school recruiting and player development. But, you know, if you didn't have, you know, the possibility of getting Sam Hartman, then your quarterback probably would have been Tyler Buckner with three starts under his belt, which I guess is good enough at Alabama. But <laughs> it's, still, uh, it's still, you know, not as – uh, not as much of a known as getting a guy that's thrown for 13,000 yards and 110 touchdowns or whatever it is, uh, and that's seen every kind of blitz and every kind of coverage. Um, so I thought that was really encouraging. Yeah, I mean, I understand the concern from a Notre Dame fan perspective when you say it took Notre, Notre Dame didn't take a single graduate transfer for eight cycles um, before it finally got to that. It's like, that's sort of an example of how slow Notre Dame can move with some of these things. And if Notre Dame doesn't figure out a better way to take undergraduate transfers for eight cycles, like how much, how much is that inhibiting Marcus Freeman in trying to take this for program forward to the next step? Um, I think there are ways to certainly overcome that. Um, and I don't think it, it will probably ever be sort of the lifeblood of Notre Dame's football program. It just doesn't necessarily make much of a match it's sort of in, it's sort of in the same way that some of the nil conversations don't sort of make a lot of sense for for notre dame football in terms of what they're trying to sell recruits and then if they're in the same sort of conversations that maybe some other schools are having um illegally or legally on the nil front it's like well what are, what are you actually selling here if you're talking out of one side of your mouth but then you're doing other things in a different way um and that's sort of the dilemma that notre dame's in from a from a macro point of view is like, okay, are these, are these hard stances that Notre Dame is taking in and the unique ways that Notre Dame wants to present itself as a football program? Are, can they be overcome? What needs to be done to overcome? Where can they push things into the gray areas that they maybe haven't been comfortable pushing into the gray areas previously, but, but not taking away from the overall product that is continuing to, to, to pitch to high school recruits and, and transfers alike. I think, Tyler, if I were in that room and I try to think about my own alma mater, Ohio State, if I would be offended if someone got an Ohio State degree that had started elsewhere. And I wouldn't be, but I can understand the Notre Dame degree is something that they're selling and recruiting that's unique or at least rare uh, that opens different kinds of doors. Mm -hmm. um, but but my thought is, let's say you, you've completed a couple years somewhere else and you're going to have two or three years at Notre Dame. Aren't you taking your hardest classes as a junior or senior? Wouldn't you be earning right. and showing your – so I that that would be my argument in those, those meetings is that, you know, they would be – you know, it's not like they would just be taking electives and not get a degree. Right. Um, and, and really from the get-go – Cody Riggs was the first in, mm -hmm. in, among the grad transfers, and he came in and was hugely successful academically, and he was a starter on the football team. He returned punts. He played cornerback. He started every game, I think, that he wasn't injured, and I might have been injured a game. And really, when you look at the grad transfers, they've been very successful from an academic standpoint. You look at the four undergrad transfers, so in addition to Brandon Joseph, you had Alohi Gilman and you had uh, Amir Carlisle, who's now back at the university in a, a football capacity. And then you had Jordan Prestwood from Florida State. And Jordan was really the only one that didn't make it academically. And, and so I pointed out to Marcus that 
I, I didn't use this in in my story, but I said you've got a really good sampling of academic success. He goes, yes. But what's pointed out to me is it's a small sample size. <laughs> and so, yeah. And, and I wonder, like, do you do and I don't know that anyone would speak to this, frankly, like do the Brandon Joseph story, like make this more possible or less possible? I, I like yeah. w w him coming in and coming to Notre Dame for a year to jump to the NFL. Is that really what what the people that are running the schools want to see? Like and now yeah. I don't know, like you, you mentioned the men's basketball program, uh, Mike Shrewsbury getting a sophomore to transfer. That was Julian Roper from Northwestern. Was right. that easier because Brandon Joseph made a transfer from Northwestern recently? I don't, I don't know. I haven't asked uh, about that. Um, so I, I'm just sort of curious, like how much, how much did the Brandon Joseph experience help or hurt Notre Dame's push forward? And like you said, that when we're talking about such small samples, like it, it seems kind of foolish to point to one person as like this is why or why it won't, why or why not it will or won't uh, work. So I think. Um, Notre Dame's probably going to continue to be choosy, but I think there's got to be a path forward for Notre Dame to be able to find those. And then the, the the problem is that is like, how do you find someone that is such a perfect fit, and also recruit them in such the, the in such a quick time span where these recruitments sort of don't don't necessarily last very long? The, some of these are done before the kids even enter the transfer portal, and that's right. that's going to be really hard for Notre Dame when it comes to an undergraduate student because how do you get all those? those I's dotted and those T's crossed because that is a very complicated um, process for Notre Dame. Right. We should point out of the other three undergraduate transfers they've taken in modern times. And there were guys decades ago that did have a scholarship to scholarship transfer, but just in modern times here, you know, Prestwood, Carlisle and Alohi were all freshmen. They had all just finished their freshman year. Right. So um, again, they didn't have a lot of, credits that had to transfer Florida state USC and, and Navy were the three schools. So yeah, it's a fascinating topic because uh, I think this is the biggest to me, it's the biggest challenge for Notre Dame from a, an even playing field. You know, if the transfer pool is smaller than, you know, Notre Dame has learned to live with its smaller pool in the high school market. But, but to have the transfer market shrunk so much is really a difficult thing. But I, I do I am confident there is a way to kind of work that out. And so we'll see. But, yeah, you mentioned things move slow. And, and the beginning of my story was I kind of introduced it to the fact that Marcus and Brian Kelly hadn't really had a conversation other than running each other in a restaurant in South Bend a few months ago. Do Since, we? I wanted to ask you: Do we know the restaurant? Are we willing to share the restaurant? I do not know the restaurant. I did not <laughs> ask it. Okay. I just I, assumed it was McDonald's, but <laughs> but I did not ask at the restaurant. I figure it was probably one that was too, you know, that I wouldn't run into them there because <laughs> I wouldn't be able to pay the bill there. But uh, I I don't know which one. I should I should ask him when I have a follow up. But I mean, seriously, when you got thirty minutes. And you're yeah. trying to jam as sure, much material sure. as I was. It was like, I mean, as few of follow up questions as you were trying to do or of anything for office. I had 45, that question would have been asked. So, <laughs> but but the I, one think thing, it was, I think it was worth leaving off your list. But one of the things that both of them do, there, there's not a lot of commonality with those guys. There's not a lot of things. You know, I asked Marcus, you know, who's, who's influenced you? We've talked about that before. And I said, you really haven't. In corporate, I had a lot of Brian Kelly, but they were only together for a year. Right. The one thing they have both done is fight for the football program. They've just done it in different ways. Kelly was pretty bombastic about it. He wasn't afraid to hurt feelings and step on toes. And boy, he did. He made some enemies. Um, and yet, I'd say overall, he got most of what he wanted. The problem was when he left, he left the message that either implied or kind of through his narrative that he came up with uh, when he got down to LSU that you can't win a national championship at Notre Dame, even though he had been preaching that for 12 years that you could and fought for that. And, and then that kind of landed in Marcus's lap. So I think that's one of the reasons why Marcus Freeman is sensitive to not sending that message because mm -hmm. He wants to fight for these things, but he says we're still good enough 
to compete. They just make it a little bit easier. Yeah. In my perspective, I'm curious what you thought. Like, I would imagine like all the failures that happened before Brian Kelly were like helped him. And even though he maybe hurt some feelings or like, and was pushing people around to get things done the way he wanted to get things done. He probably, people were probably, they couldn't say, well, this is working so well for us. Like our football program has not reached the heights we yeah. want it to reach to. Now, granted, Brian Kelly didn't win a national championship, but he made it much more competitive during his tenure than it was prior to him. Um, so I, I don't know if Brian Kelly's maybe PR shade that he threw out going out the door um, to LSU is extra momentum in any way to Marcus Freeman being able to get some things done. I'm, I'm very curious, like how how the, I, I can't imagine that that is worth as much as maybe the previous failings of the coaches that came before Brian Kelly helped Brian Kelly get the things that he wanted. You know what? I am supposed to have an interview with Jack Swarbrick in a week or two. And when I do, that's an excellent question to ask him and see what he says because he's going out the door. He can tell <laughs> yeah. Right, right, yeah. He can be honest, right? <laughs> that's right. He could say, oh, this is on Pete Pavakwa now, but this is what I would have done. Um, so, yeah, that was – that was um, it was it was really interesting to see his approach to it, but they both thought – if Brian Kelly, what helped him was getting to the championship game in his third year, had that 2016 season right. transposed, he wouldn't have had a <laughs> leg to stand on. But, yeah. you know, that's when – then he did the – you know, I mean, he wouldn't have gotten away with interviewing with the Eagles either, you know, right <laughs> after right <laughs> after the season. That would right. have been uh, a slap in the face. But uh, it worked out for him. And I'm not downgrading what Brian Kelly was able to bring to Notre Dame. He left Notre Dame in a much better place overall it's just when he was exiting that was a messy unnecessarily messy exit i thought so so something that uh brian kelly certainly alluded to was the facilities at notre dame um and what how he felt about lsu's facilities and maybe the differences between uh notre dame and lsu's facilities what's your understanding of where notre dame stands and where marcus freeman stands on what what the Irish need to do in order to push things forward and how close they are um, in terms of making that a reality. So in my history with Brian Kelly, between the 2016 and 2017 season, I spent a day in June with him. It was actually the day that the freshmen that year arrived, like it was Darnell Ewell and Heinish and those guys. And, um, he talked about, he was kind of showing what his plan was to reinvent himself. But part of the reinvention was some new facilities. And there were two steps to it. One was the indoor facility, which got built in a very timely fashion. It was the desperate, this wasn't to impress recruits. This was pragmatic. I mean, Notre Dame had to share the Loftus Center, the indoor facility with all the other sports. There were times they had to do the team run at five in the morning, you know, and, and, that's all well and good when you're trying to make a point or punish somebody, but <laughs> when you're trying to go to class and get a certain grade point average, that's not exactly conducive. So they got the that facility at open the Irish Athletic Center open in 2019, I believe, in August. And then the other part of it that was supposed to follow right thereafter was extending the Google Amino Athletics complex, mainly the football complex, but other teams use parts of it, out to where it would connect with the um, indoor facility, close down Courtney Lane, which is a street that splits them. And you would have more recovery area. You'd have your own kitchen. You could have a more orderly uh, training tables and so forth. Uh, there were all kinds of commitments with that. A be better study area it would just make Sunday through Friday football a, a better proposition. And, you know, certainly were there bells and whistles? I mean, maybe, but this is, again, was more of a pragmatic thing than it was, hey, we Clemson's got a slide, so we need, you know, a swing set or whatever. <laughs> um, so, um, and then it seemed like the wheel slowed on that. Now, Notre Dame's policy is getting the money together, getting the donations committed, and then having most of the cash at hand before you start construction. Right. Um, and it seemed to slow down, and the and the uh, pandemic slowed it down even further. I mean, Notre Dame was 
you know, letting people go in the athletic department. People were taking pay cuts. We didn't know how long it was going to last. And so then Brian Kelly leaves. And again, I think the, the facilities complaints that Brian Kelly, I don't want to say that they're imaginary. I think they were overstated as the reason why he left. He was building a forever house a mile from campus. Right. You know, he could have held off on that if he really felt like, you know, this is a chronic problem that's not going to get solved. Uh, when I asked Marcus about it, he kind of paused and I said, you probably get this a lot. And he's like, <laughs> <laughs> he goes, every one of these and every <laughs> talk I give, it comes up. And, and so again, he really tried to emphasize the reason we went nine and four wasn't because the Goog hasn't expanded. Now, I mean, at least we know the plans have changed and it does feel like there's a lot more momentum for it. Um, they're going to expand out towards, if you've not been on campus before, the tennis, the Eck Tennis Center, and there's tennis courts right next to the Loftus Center. They're going to expand out that way instead of closing down Courtney Lane and going across the street. But they're going to have all the things and maybe more than, than the original plans had suggested. But the thing is, how quickly? I mean, it's not going to be, even if they got the funding tomorrow, it's not like you can build it in six months. Well, you especially know. in a facility when it's connecting to facilities that you already use, that probably doesn't make Correct. it any easier. Correct. So, I mean, it's still down the road, but I think once there's that commitment, I think certainly you could sell it to recruits. But again, I don't know that we've run across a recruit that said, you know what? Notre Dame's facilities just aren't nice enough. I'm going to Auburn or whatever. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to Arkansas because they have a slide. Um, you you were talking about the Loftus earlier, and I, I wanted to point this out. Like the Irish Athletic Center is like a key part of the recruiting absolutely. tour experience. Like they will set like on official visit weekends. That's like essentially home base. That's like where they they welcome people to the Irish Athletic Center because it is that much more attractive than the Loftus is. For the Loftus functionality, obviously there was the issues with the the sharing it with other teams, but it's pretty dingy and dark in that place, and it's not. It's not the beautiful Irish Athletic Center with all this natural light, um, and uh, I think and, it's and whenever they put it in there, you take <laughs> chunks out of the ceiling. <laughs> Pieces of the ceiling would come falling down. Uh, uh, so the Irish Athletic Center, like like Eric was saying, if you haven't been on campus, it is very visually appealing, and, and, and it's, and it's uh, a centerpiece of sort of the recruiting tour. Um, for for Notre Dame and it, like I don't I don't know that they sort of use the Loftus in that sort same sort of way I don't recall them using it in that same sort of way um, as part of recruiting visits and sort of being I think like, here's our indoor facility okay <laughs> yeah the next thing here's our weight room let's move on to the weight room everybody <laughs> nothing to see here I mean I think kids were there sometimes during spring practice but again it was packed it was dingy um and there wasn't a media appreciation lounge which is what i call the area where we do our interviews i don't think they call it the media appreciation lounge but no i think it's the recruit appreciation lounge <laughs> yeah but i've i've kind of commandeered it so but it is i mean it, functionality is great in it and it is impressive i mean it's a really neat facility and they use it a lot in the spring uh because the weather is either cold or wet or both or white, um, and so they need to need to use that facility. But um, I, he did seem, you know, he, he was like, "Now it's going to happen." I, I'm happy with the momentum. You know, he was he wanted to move on to the next topic, which we did. Yeah, well, the topic that I'm sure reporters aren't the only ones talking to him. I'm sure recruits and their, and their families are talking to Marcus Freeman about is NIL. What did you learn from Marcus Freeman about where he feels? the program is with its NIL opportunities? I think he's pretty happy with it. Um, you know, we went, uh, NIL is really two years old. It'll be two years old as of July 1st. Mm -hmm. And, but really the, the impactful recruiting cycle was 2023. Well, that's when we come into play. And we saw all the ugliness of it. And we also saw some of the good possibilities of it as well. And, and it made a lot of administrators nervous and it made a lot of coaches nervous. Um, 
you know, Marcus was comfortable with Notre Dame having these opportunities, teaching players about them, but not getting into the, we're going to get into acquisition fees. And I know that angers a lot of fans Mm -hmm. because they want them to do what other schools are doing. I think some of the acquisition fees at certain schools, I think are more perceived than real. Yes. Um, I think if you're recruiting defensive linemen to Georgia, you don't, do you really think you have to offer them money to come there? (laughs) And, and, And I think that, I mean, because they're just putting them in the NFL right and left. And and I think when we talked to Brady Quinn on our um, Inside Indy Sports podcast, he was mentioning that a lot of the kids that he was talking to had seen, okay, do I want NIL money, which is kind of a big, a big deal, but it's not lasting, or do I want generational wealth that being developed into an NFL player is going to get me? And mm-hmm. And there's been, I think, a shift. Marcus didn't see that as much as he did kids seeing how fake some of the NIL money was, how a lot of it was created on internet sites saying, well, this is what your worth is, and and, and that not being a reality. And also some of the things that kids were promised weren't delivered to them. Mm-hmm. And so they would sign with a certain school, and then the money wasn't there. And so... I think a lot of kids said, okay, what's real, what's not real in this? And Notre Dame has been able to show the real part of it. Now, I said, I think they've been criticized fairly at times for not saying this is what our NIL plan is. It's almost like it's a secret. Right. But Marcus Freeman is okay with them not beating their chest on it, feeling like, when they come for the recruiting visit, they do have an NIL presentation. There's chance chances to ask questions and they get into it more there. They're not kind of outwardly saying, you know, for example, I was talking to Audric Estime. He's got a he's got a handful of things, little offers. He was telling me about a photo shoot he was doing and stuff. I didn't know anything about that, you know. Yeah. Uh, I guess when I see him modeling, when I see uh, Austin Powers taking pictures of him. <laughs> uh, that that we'll see it, but I mean, he's got a few. I hope he gets one for the chicken parm sandwich back in his hometown because he's a great spokesman for that. But you don't hear about that. I mean, you, I mean, Sam Hartman's got several deals. When I talked to Joe Alt, I know there are people very interested in him being an All American, right? Uh, but again, I mean, you kind of hear about the weird ones like the dude wipes that the offensive linemen had and mm-hmm. all the food places they have, but uh. Not, not the big money. So it was really interesting. And, and this 2024 cycle is going to be very telling. Now, I also asked Marcus, I'm not sure I made the point of it as much in the story because of his answer. Um, and it was, are you recruiting differently because of what happened with NIL and Notre Dame in the last cycle? And his, his answer was essentially no. And yet he said, but we're always evaluating how we recruit. So I thought that's probably a more confusing answer if I really get into the weeds with that. So, Yeah, I mean, I think from my perspective of, of covering recruiting, I think if Notre Dame senses that that is going to be like number one on a, on a recruit's list, they're not going to maybe invest as much in that recruit. And be willing to say, just say, hey, that's not. We're not going to be able to win this battle here if that's what's most important to that recruit, um, because they believe that's not what's most important to what Notre Dame is offering um, those players. So um, I think I feel like I see that a little bit more. I guess I, I, I would probably need to go back and look and see if there were other guys that that happened with. But the the problem with what happened in the twenty twenty three cycle is that it seemed to happen with guys that were already committed when it was still early on in this NIL era and not really sure what was out there for, for guys to get um, and what other schools may be presenting or offering um, and how much that mattered to those kids as they learn more about their different opportunities elsewhere. Um, so I think everyone's probably starting in a, at least a more clear, right. With a more clear understanding of NIL and what's out there now, although that's <laughs> seems sort of uh silly to say about NIL because I don't know that anything's extremely clear when it comes to that topic, but um, I think there's sort of a better understanding of what, what programs are really prioritizing that and 
if that is something that you really value, I think there's obvious places that you may gravitate towards. And I think you can sort of see that with some visitors list when you see a number of kids going to Oregon and Tennessee um, and UCLA, it's like, well, okay, those schools have been uh, connected to NIL deals and programs in my, or Miami. Um, I think Texas that, A&M. Texas no A&M. Offense, Carter. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Carter. Uh, uh, for those, uh, so when you see those visits, uh, multiple of those visits, you start to wonder, um, what's going on there? Is that what? How much? Because the kids, kids rarely say like, yes, NIL is very important to me. They're they're not, especially kids that Notre Dame is recruiting. They're not going to come out and say that. And Marcus Freeman says if they do, then they're not going to be a fit. That's what he said. If they're walking in the door and that's their biggest concern, then they're not going to be a fit for them. Yeah, I mean, for instance, Teddy Rezac, someone who committed to Notre Dame, um, I think it was in May, and then he, so he came on a visit, then committed following that on official visit, and then he came back in June for his official visit. He said on that official visit, he learned a little bit more about the NIL stuff. Like that wasn't why he committed to Notre Dame, but he did want to have a better understanding of it. Um, for his future moving forward. And so that was sort of a follow-up, an ancillary part of coming to Notre Dame is like, this is what is available. These are the these are the ways that you can make money through NIL at Notre Dame and the success that various kids have had um, with NIL opportunities. All right. Anything more on the Marcus Freeman front or you want to move on to recruiting? Um, j- just real quickly, I, I you had a chance to ask him about Jack Swarbrick and Pete Vavacqua yeah. and that transition. What were what were what did you learn from Marcus Freeman about his insight to um, to both of those those guys out the outgoing one and the incoming one? Well, I mean, he's he's indebted to Jack Schwarber because he felt like he took a chance on him. You know, he was surprised that Jack is picking this timing. I think if he thinks about it, it it makes sense. Uh, but he was surprised by it. But then he went on to talk about um, what makes Jack Swarbrick good at what he does. And I mean, it's being a leader in every sense. This is Marcus's words. Um, and not just at Notre Dame and, and with the football program, but also like with the college football playoff. I mean, Jack Swarbrick, you could argue, is the architect of the 12 team playoff. And so um, getting Notre Dame into the ACC, getting them, you know, kind of a foot in the door there so that they, uh, that their other sports weren't, independence and so forth so he had great respect for him pete bavacqua is not a stranger to marcus freeman they've spent some time together including at the kentucky derby and marcus did note that he was making bets <laughs> um so but he said he hasn't really had a chance to sit down and talk to him about what his vision is you know he understands the passion that pete has for notre dame how much he loves the football program and he feels like this is a really good hire but he doesn't maybe know the depth of why he thinks it's a good hire because right. they haven't sat down yet and talked about their vision. But Pete's going to be coming aboard, I think, July 1st. And then it'll be, um, you know, Pete and Jack together for at least six months. And then Jack will eventually uh, move on to his next chapter. All right. Uh, let's do some on-air producing here, Eric. How much do, do we want to try to get both of these – that your sort of notebook items in on, on the injuries and stuff and the recruiting questions. We don't have a ton of questions. I do have some questions that were submitted, not via YouTube that I can throw into the mix. What, how should we, 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 we haven't spoken on air together so long that we, we take 40 minutes on the first, uh, the first item on our uh, outline of today's uh, show. Well, let me run through the, I think I can run through the um, notes, okay. team notes pretty quickly. And then we'll go to recruiting because I'm sure some people tuned in just for that. So, um, you know, the, when I talked to Marcus, the freshman had been in class for four days and he had seen them work out with the returning guys once. They were doing mostly running and stuff. He had obviously been getting reports from the weight room for from Matt Bayless, director of football performance. Um and he just is so impressed with the way freshmen come in now, ready to work. You know, you used to have kids come in, and it was this big culture shock. Uh, but they come in ready to work. The four players that kind of stood out to him on the first day, and remember, these are early impressions, not lasting ones necessarily. We're running back Jeremiah Love, wide receiver Caleb K.K. Smith, 
the there were a couple Caleb Smiths on hmm. the roster for a very brief period. Defensive end Brendan Vernon and defensive end Bubakar Traore. As far as a team injury and recovery in update, there are really only three players that weren't aren't able to do everything everybody else done. One is one of the freshmen coming in, Charles Jagaza, Charles Jagaza, offensive tackle who had PCL surgery in February. And his timeline may run into the season itself, and he wasn't going to be counted on. The other two are the two tight ends that had ACL tears during the season last year, Eli Reardon and uh, Kevin Bauman. They're both doing very well, uh, but they're limited a little bit on their volume. Uh, From a quarterback standpoint, I asked him, hey, did you kick the tires on quarterbacks? You know, they do their due diligence and somebody might have gotten a phone call or, or, you know, an inquiry about them, some interest, but they didn't seriously pursue a portal quarterback. They felt like Steve Angeli and Kenny Minchie were the two. And you, you could have risked losing one of those guys had you taken a portal QB. Um, I asked him about Devin Ford. Was he a response to the uncertainty with Jer- Jadarian Price and the nature of his injury? a ruptured Achilles tendon last June. He said it wasn't. The Devin checked a lot of boxes in terms of a guy with elite speed, experience, special teams experience. So those were the reasons why Devin Ford was a nice fit for them. And finally, Philip and Riley and Josh Bryan, we kind of waited for them to get into the uh, transfer portal. The beginning of spring, Marcus Freeman announced they wouldn't be part of the team. They are going to stay on as students. Uh, that's their their um, aim right now, not just for to the end of this, you know, summer or whatever. But they plan on graduating from Notre Dame. They were both academically sophomores last year, and that's it on the notebook. And, and that's a pretty cool fact. Like, I can't like I can't imagine there's a lot of examples of that across college football where the guys are basically giving up a year of college football to continue to graduate at the school they want and then evaluate if they want to go somewhere else after, after graduating. So that's pretty, pretty interesting to, to know that those guys are still enrolled at Notre Dame and moving toward the, their Notre Dame degrees. They're hard to fit in a category though. (laughs) (laughs) They're not transfers, but right. Not injury hardships, but. Yep. Um, So let's get, let's start first with some recruiting questions. Um, I'll sort of combine two that one was from Frank Sarah here. Um, how many players will Indy take in the 2024 recruiting cycle? And there was a question on the inside lounge from SJB 75. Um, 2024 recruiting is in the home stretch after Saturday, assuming that your two future casts, you're being me, uh, for Wednesday and Saturday, Tabron, Benny Powell, and Bronte Johnson are indeed Notre Dame. What is your ideal realistic finish for 2024 recruiting, assuming we have no decommitments? Um, so I did sort of map out what I thought would sort of be the ideal. Um, so if if Tabron, Benny Powell, and, and Bronte Johnson, who are both safety targets for Notre Dame, commit um, to the average this week, that'll put them at 21 commits. Um, and then sort of the number is dependent on who wants in. Like there's probably always going to be room for Gerby Lambert. There's always going to be room for Kingston, Villiamuasa, uh, the linebacker, Lambert, bringing an offensive lineman. Um, Caleb Beasley is a cornerback that's committed to Tennessee. If he wants to join Notre Dame's class, Notre Dame's going to take him. Um, Carter Nelson, I think, is probably in the same boat. A tight end um, who's considering Georgia, Nebraska, Penn State, um, and Notre Dame. Justin Scott, the five-star defensive tackle. If there's room for him, or if he wants in, there's going to always be room for him. So I that would be the sort of like ideal finish, I think, if you get those guys. That gets you to 26. Um, and I, I, think that, I think all of those guys are realistic. None of those guys are like, impossible victories for Notre Dame. Like they're all going to be hard recruiting vic- wins. Um, but I think those are all, I would still qualify them as realistic. The wild card there is Davis Andrews, who is technically a 2024 recruit. Um, the way he plans to attack his, a two year mission would be to graduate early and then uh, start his mission immediately after high school, rather than enroll um, at a school um, and, start his career sort of like uh Kahano Kia did for um for Notre Dame who enrolled in the fall um and uh 
then in the spring some for the spring semester went on his two-year mission um so i think we can you, whether you want to include him he's going to be included in the class ranking so i would include him so that would make 27 and then i think the the things that notre dame is trying to figure out is like okay if we get all those guys do we still have room for bradley shaw who's a linebacker who notre dame made some significant ground with on his official visit earlier this month do we have room for Malcolm Ziegler, a safety or cornerback prospect, preferably safety, but I think it also plays some cornerback if if needed. Um, who visited her th earlier this month? Notre Dame made a good impression with. I don't think those those guys aren't like definitely going to pick Notre Dame, but I think Notre Dame is trying to figure out if they're going to have room for them. Bradley Shaw doesn't plan on making a decision anytime soon. He wants to make official visits to Alabama and Auburn in the fall, um, so there's a chance he even gets back on campus for a game. Um, at Notre Dame on an unofficial visit. So that one, they have plenty of time to sort of sort that out and figure that one out. Um, so that's sort of the math, the names to know um, in terms of how how many Notre Dame players, how many players Notre Dame will take in this class. Um, but it, it, like if, say, Kingston Viliamu Asa doesn't want to commit to Notre Dame, then I think they would just take Bradley Shaw then if, if he still wants to come. Um and so those, it all sort of depends on that. Like, but Kingston himself would have a spot, even if Bradley Shaw wanted to commit. Notre Dame would have would have given Bradley Shaw a spot, knowing that it would still be still be willing to take Kingston Villamuasa. So that's it's not it's not as cut and dry as people want it to be all the time. It's like how many are they going to take? It's like well, who wants in? When do they want in? Uh, there's a lot of variables that that come with that in the recruiting cycle. I think you just like to say Kingston Villamuasu. <laughs> Well, uh, if you can miss another name, we'll have plenty of opportunities to say it. Moving KVA. Forward. KVA. That, that's how I write him in my notes. It's much easier to, to spell KVA um, than to write out his full name. But uh, I have the spelling down, uh, having written it plenty of times throughout his recruitment already. Okay. So wh what's coming up on the recruiting calendar? I mean, the, June is a big month. Um, what do we have immediately in, you know, in the next – 10 days or whatever till the month is out. Yeah. As was alluded to in that previous question, uh, Tabron Benny Powell and a three-star athlete from Lakota West high school in Ohio is announcing his commitment decision tomorrow, Wednesday. Um, and so we will learn if Notre Dame is his choice um, when he announces that, excuse me. Um, and then on Saturday, a, th a four-star athlete Bronte Johnson out of Fort Wayne, um, he will be announcing his commitment decision. Um, and both of those guys our safety targets for Notre Dame, they're athletes uh, on Rivals, uh, according to the Rivals profiles and the projections for them on Rivals uh, by the Rivals analysts. Um, but those are guys that I believe will end up picking Notre Dame. I have future cast predictions in for both of them um, to pick Notre Dame, and we will see if I am right or wrong uh, in the coming days. But that will give some clarity in terms of what's going on at the safety position um, for Notre Dame and what where else they need to go Um in the class. And I think there's a chance if those guys both commit that then they just say, okay, we'll take Davis Andrews who isn't technically going to be here until 2026 um, and call it a day at the safety position. But they also are still considering if they have room for, for Malcolm Ziegler, like I mentioned earlier. Okay. And then um, there was an evaluation camp that you and Charleston uh, attended today while I was at the little league parks. What happened there? <laughs> Yeah, um, so an interesting. I, there was a evalu evaluation camp last week. I think five offers came out of that camp. Um, so far tonight, I believe there's only been one offer reported, and that happened while we were uh, doing the show. Joseph Reef of a defensive end out of Elmhurst, Elmhurst. The Notre Dame offers a 2025 recruit. Um, Charleston spent time watching the defensive lineman, and he included him on our list of standouts. So. Uh, props to Charleston for catching on to someone who impressed before he announced that he had received a Notre Dame offer. Um, and uh, so, yeah, there were a number of guys there. There were two guys that came to the camp today who already had offers. Trey Harrison, a safety um, out of Junipero Serra High School in, in California. Um, I thought he looked pretty good. He was both good in coverage and doing some of the pursuit drills that they Chris O'Leary had the, the defensive backs doing. Um, I think he could potentially even be a cornerback. I thought he played played pretty well in the cornerback uh, in coverage, so um, a bit versatile there. And then Tariq Hayer, 
um, is someone who Notre Dame offered back uh, on Pot of Gold Day, uh, St. Patrick's Day, um, out of Washington, D.C. Um, I thought he was pretty pretty good as well. He didn't necessarily jump off the field in terms of like having elite speed or size, but he was he was pretty shut down when it came to covering guys when they were doing one on one drills and didn't allow guys to get much separation from him and um, fared pretty well regardless of guys that were bigger than him. He was listed at six foot, um, maybe is a little bit smaller than that, um, but I thought he did pretty good. And then there was a number of other wide receivers, defensive backs. There were a couple of linemen I thought were impressive, um, but no new offers yet, uh, at least as the time we're recording this here late on uh, Tuesday night. So we'll see if more of those guys receive offers. Um, but even if not, some I mean, some of these guys are 2026 20, recruits, so there's still a long way to go in their recruitment. So it's But it is good to see and get an eye on them, and uh, certainly that's what Notre Dame's coaching staff wants, to see where those guys are at in their development. Um, and, and we'll continue to monitor them if they if they sort of caught their eye with their performances at these evaluation camps, which there will be another one here on Thursday, the third and final evaluation camp of June for Notre Dame. So there's lots of kids. The evaluation camp last week, I think, had a couple hundred kids. Today it was not quite that many, but there's still over 100 kids out there, and um, it's sort of hard to wrap your head around, okay, how, how do you keep track of all these guys? So it certainly helps when Charleston and I are both able to be there um, that we're here locally and able to cover these camps and, and get get to them um, at a moment's notice, although we certainly have plenty of heads up when these camps are happening. Um, so uh, if you want more details on who else stood out, make sure you check out the story. It's uh, these recruits stood out at Notre Dame's evaluation camp. Uh, it's the uh, number one or two story on our website correct uh, currently right now. Okay. And one of the big stories over the weekend was Nate Robertson, uh tight end from Oklahoma, adding to the 2025 class, the second commit in that class. What can you tell me about Nate Robertson that's going to impress the heck out of me and everybody that's afraid to ask a question? <laughs> well, uh, first, it's that it's Nate Robertson, not Nate Robertson. Nate Roberts, okay. <laughs> I've already changed his name. <laughs> that, that's a, I don't know if that's a good sign or a bad sign for him because I don't know that a lot of the guys that you change the name for go on to have great careers at Notre Dame. But, um, well, ben Morrison. <laughs> <laughs> there you go, Ben Morrison. He, he's he's the he's the trend to follow. Uh, Nate Roberts is the number five tight end in the 2025 class, uh, according to Rivals. Six foot four, 225 pound prospect out of Washington, Oklahoma. Oklahoma really wanted him, so to pull him away from the Sooners is certainly a big deal. Um, like you said, the second commitment in the 2025 class, following a four star defensive tackle, Davion Dixon. Notre Dame is going to have and does have a lot of different options at the tight end position in the 2025 class. And Nate Roberts was someone that Notre Dame clearly prioritized. Um, and so it'd be, it's going to be fascinating to see who else is, who else is next to jump on board because there are a number of guys that have shown a lot of interest, whether it's um, James Flanagan out of Wisconsin, um, the son of a Notre Dame, former Notre Dame player, um, whether it's uh, Ryan G out of, uh, Atlanta, who's been on campus a couple times. There are some other notable tight ends in the 2025 class that Notre Dame has offered and has been already been able to get on campus. So um, <laughs> Notre Dame might not uh, – there's going to probably maybe need a kid to maybe decide before his junior season if he wants to be a tight end in Notre Dame's 2025 class because there is lots of interest and lots of talent out there that Notre Dame is, is in the mix for. And do we think that – the 2025s that we're going to, I mean, is there anybody else close at this point or is it more, Hey, look, we need to take some game day visits and that kind of thing. It's still pretty early in the cycle. Um, I think if there's another tight end, maybe I think cer there, certainly yeah, that would be one of end. them. I think quarterback could be a, a position to watch Deuce Knight. Um, I don't know exactly how soon he wants to make a decision, but some of the top 2025 20, quarterbacks are starting to make those decisions. And usually when a couple of those kids do, the, the dominoes continue to fall pretty quickly there. And, and Notre Dame and Tennessee have been um, sort of battling each other neck and neck in that recruitment. Alabama got into the mix with a recent offer and hosted him for a visit. So that makes it a little bit more interesting. But he actually was supposed to be up on campus for an unofficial visit earlier this month. Um, and then that day he ended up making a visit to Alabama instead. He told me that he plans to try to still get up here in June, although I have not heard a date associated with that visit. So we'll have to keep an eye on 
um, whether or not that happens. But his interest in Notre Dame is still definitely very high. Um, and uh, he's a very talented kid, a left-handed quarterback who has been very impressive um, on the seven-on-seven seven circuit as of late. Um, and so that those are the two names that come to mind immediately. Um, maybe maybe someone like a Justin Thurman, a running back that Notre Dame offered and got on campus for an evaluation camp last week. I think he's very high on Notre Dame. Derek Meadows, the receiver out of Las Vegas, is very high on Notre Dame. But I don't know that those guys are necessarily in a, in a hurry to make decisions. So we'll have to – it's just sort of – Depends on if the kid feels like the timing is right and they, they don't need to see any more. Um, but uh, I don't I don't know that we'll necessarily have a huge rush on 2025 commitments, but you never you never know for sure. So the question I would have is in, in the early stages at three positions, how do we feel? Joe Rudolph is a guy that had a lot of success with kids from Wisconsin at Wisconsin. Um, then he went to Virginia Tech a year. He's at Notre Dame. How do we feel like he's doing in 2025? Uh, Coach Washington on the defensive line, he's got a commitment. How do we feel like things are shaping up there? And then safety recruiting has come under some scrutiny. They've done well in the transfer market, but what about high school kids in the 2025 market? Yeah, so let's start with the offensive line. I think Joe Rudolph is in an interesting place. I think there's some guys that are are – pretty talented that are considering Notre Dame, Owen Strebig, um, probably being at the top of that list out of Wisconsin. Um, Big a four, dude. A four so, star, I mean, six, eight, huge. A four-star four recruit. Um, beyond that, I mean, David Sanders is a five-star recruit. I, I, he's the number one offensive tackle in the country. He's expressed an interest in Notre Dame. He is at uh, Providence Day High School, a school that Notre Dame is familiar with. And the current head coach there is the coach who coached. I'm forgetting his name. Uh, Greer, it's Coach Greer. Coach Chad Greer, Greer. Chad Greer, uh, who coached uh, Sam Hartman in high school. Um, so there's certainly some Notre Dame connections there. Um, but he hasn't gotten on campus for for a visit. Um, those are the big time guys. Avery Gatch out of Michigan is also a four star recruit. Um, that's someone that Notre Dame is interested in. He's shown some mutual interest there. But then you talk about some of the guys that Notre Dame offered here through the camp season. Matty Augustine uh, is a three-star recruit out of Connecticut. Um, Will Black is an unrated recruit out of Connecticut who's actually uh, a Canadian import, um, a former hockey player that is, has had, found some success playing uh, playing football and coming to the States to play football. Um, so there's some guys there that maybe aren't weren't like early on big-time prospects, but I think Notre Dame really likes the athleticism and – um, and size that some of those guys have. So it'd be interesting to see sort of what those guys look like as juniors and how polished of players they are. Um, because I think at least if you're just looking at ratings and rankings, like they're not, they're not that highly thought of at least yet, but I think there's time. And I think later this month here, still in June rivals will be updating its 2025 class or player ratings and rankings. So we'll, we'll get a sense of, what the consensus or national perspective is on, on some of those guys that maybe Notre Dame has offered that don't have ratings or rankings yet. Um, as for defensive line, there's a lot of guys that are interested in Notre Dame. I don't, I don't know that there's a ton of guys that I feel like, okay, they're ready to commit for Notre Dame. I, they have been very aggressive in terms of offering guys. I'm, I'm looking here just at guys that we list as weak side defensive ends in the rivals database, there's, I don't know, eyeballing it more than 10 already in the 2025 class. Um, and most of those guys have at least four stars. Um, I don't have it. Gus Ritchie is one. Uh, he's a, listed as a strong side defensive end. He's been on campus a couple times. He, there's certainly high interest um, from him in Notre Dame. Um, Nathaniel Marshall is someone who's been on campus uh, as well. He's out of the Chicago area. Gabe Kaminsky is also out of the Chicago area. Um, those are guys that I think, um, Notre Dame's a good spot with it. Christopher Burgess, he maybe he's the one that's the most familiar. He seems to get on campus at seemingly every opportunity he gets, um, and his recruitment continues to blow up. He's only rated as a three-star, but Alabama was one of his recent offers. And, yeah, he's um, not going to stay a three-star. Yeah, he's continuing to to get him a lot of attention there. Um, so I don't – there's not a – When like Clint a, Cosgrove gets off mater, or paternity leave – <laughs> that, that's going to change pretty soon. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, 
So yeah, I mean, there's plenty of work left to do there for Notre Dame, but they're evaluating guys and getting 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 being aggressive with offers. Um, but there's not a long list of guys that I, I would say like, okay, these guys are on the verge of joining Notre Dame's class, but they are, I think, shooting pretty high with the offers, which I think maybe is the concern a little bit from the offensive line standpoint of, okay, how good are these guys that Notre Dame's actually going after? In terms of safeties with Chris O'Leary, which is certainly not necessarily gone as planned in the 2025 class or 2024 class, um, Notre Dame has a number of different offers out. Trey McNutt, I think, is probably the guy that they would love to have the most, um, who's from Cleveland, Ohio, has been on campus a couple times. Um, he attended the Irish Invasion, didn't compete because he didn't necessarily need to, um, but he was uh, on campus for that visit. Um, but then there's guys like Ethan Long, who's out of Connecticut, um, and Notre Dame's pretty early on his offer list, but I think his offer list continues to grow as he makes more camp visits throughout the summer. So is Notre Dame early and catching on to a guy that's about to blow up or are they reaching too early? I think sometimes we, we don't really have the best answer to that. Everyone has their own opinion on evaluating kids because not everyone sees the same things at certain prospects. So um, Remington Moss is a guy that's been on campus um, a couple of times receiving and was well, he, he competed in the Irish invasion. Um, so there's a number of guys that Notre Dame has set their sights on early. Trey Harrison, who I talked about earlier, um, was on campus today um, as a three-star athlete who's a safety target for Notre Dame. So um, Jordan Young is a North Carolina kid who was on campus um, that Notre Dame likes a lot. So there's there's a lot of names to know, but I, I don't know that it's sort of, sort of the same position as the defensive line. I don't know that there's a lot of names to know in terms of guys that may be entering Notre Dame's class here anytime soon, but uh, we'll have to see sort of how the dust settles. And especially as Notre Dame's 2024 class fills up, Notre Dame can sort of amplify the intensity with which they're recruiting these 2025 recruits at as well. And Notre Dame appears to be on the verge of hiring somebody new to help with recruiting in terms of the evaluation and a new director of scouting and Matt Jansen who's most recently been at West Virginia, got promoted two times in the four years he was there. Um, from his initial position, he's got some NFL background, was at Texas Tech as a student assistant under, primarily under Mike Leach, had a, had a season or two under Tommy Tuberville. Uh, but that's a big addition for Notre Dame once they get around to announcing it and making that official. And so uh, that's part of the infrastructure that uh, uh, Marcus Freeman continues to build with in some reload. This would be replacing Bill Reese, who was the director of scouting um, in the last part of the Brian Kelly era in the first year of uh, Marcus Freeman's regime. All right. I think that just about does it. I think we hit all the things we wanted to hit on here. Um, tonight for Football Never Sleeps. Is there anything else on your list, Eric? Um, nothing else on my list except subscribe, <laughs> like, and hit the notification bell. I've learned that from watching other people's videos. It does help us <laughs> yes. for you to do it, and it doesn't cost anything. Yes, we are not asking for money here on our YouTube site. Um, you certainly we are uh, at our regular site, but not on our YouTube <laughs> Yeah, InsideIndieSports.com, you want, you want to get all this information ahead of time. Uh, subscribe to us there, get the information on the Insider Lounge. Um, we're constantly updating where things are at for Notre Dame in the recruiting cycle um, and information that we're hearing about Notre Dame's football program. Uh, so we hope uh, – and Charleston's doing a pretty good job of doing some basketball recruiting coverage too if you're interested in that. And Eric's been doing a good job for over a year now in terms of the women's basketball recruiting coverage as well. So we have uh, some pretty good coverage there. Um, that I think if you're interested in those programs that you'll, you'll want to know what, what we're hearing about those, the recruiting efforts um, that Notre Dame is having um, with both of those teams. So um, like Eric said, subscribe, like, leave some comments. Um, we want to hear from you. Um, we, I, well, we won't be back next week uh, for football never sleeps because now it's my turn to start taking some vacation. Uh, but uh, Eric will probably try to get on here with, with um, Charleston at some point and try to Wally pit me this time um, in terms of uh, getting you guys uh, some information via YouTube. Eric and I will do an Inside Indie Sports podcast uh, tomorrow, Wednesday. Um, so be on the lookout for that if you are a podcast listener to us. 
Um, and I will continue to uh, put the football never sleeps um, recording in the, the podcast feed as well. So um, hopefully you're taking advantage of all those different ways to listen and hear from us um, and make sure you're supporting us on InsideNDSports.com as well. And have a great evening.